Asian primates, and Asian primatology. Where are we at now? The description of new primate taxa in recent years has brought us quite a bit of excitement and reasons for celebration. However, the threats to Asian primates do not seem to have abated. In fact, they are increasingly threatened with extinction. How does this spell out for the Asian primates? Similarly, how does this spell out for Asian primatology? Today I shall talk briefly about the status of the Asian primates and then delve more into the gaps and challenges of primatology in Asia, but mostly from a conservation practitioner's perspective. Now let's take a look at Asian primates. By the way, before I continue, do note that I prepared some aspects of my talk for the grad students in mind. Let's first look at the primate diversity. Globally, the primate diversity is at more than 500 species, or 700 species and subspecies. As of about two weeks ago, we have recognized a total of 129 Asian species, or 226 species and subspecies. So, Asia is home to slightly over 30% of the global primate diversity. Also, we have almost 40 taxa more than two years ago. Did we discover a large number of new primates within the last two years? And why this difference with the IUCN red test? I'll respond to these questions in a little while. I would like to first give the audience a quick glimpse into our rich primate diversity. By the way, the oldest fossil primate found to date is also from Asia, China specifically. We have two genera from the family Loricidae. Research by our colleagues, notably Anna Karis and her associates, have yielded much interesting information on the lorises, previously unbeknownst to even exist in primates. Then we have the Tarsidae. The past decade has seen a number of new taxa described, including two recently described species, the Gursky's spectral tarsia, named after Dr. Sharon Gursky, and the Supriyatna's tarsia, named after Dr. Jatna Supriyatna, both of whom have contributed significantly to the advancements of primatology in Asia. The bulk of the Asian primates belong to the family Cercopithecidae. In this slide, I have the rhesus macaque, probably the oldest and best studied primate giving rise to numerous publications, dissertations, and theses, including my master's. Then we have the proboscis monkey. I view the proboscis monkey with mixed emotions. The proboscis monkey of North Borneo gave me my PhD, but it pains me that much of its habitats are now either replaced by oil palm plantations or severely fragmented. We also have one baboon species in Asia, Representing the Presbytis group, I here have the Maroon Langer. The Presbytis group is restricted to the Sundaic region. The colorful Red Shen Duke is one species you should definitely put on your bucket list. The Tonkin Snubnose Monkey of Vietnam is another subchapter in my life. In 1993, very fresh with a PhD, I was assigned by WCS and co-founded by PCI to determine the conservation status of the species. The species long thought extinct was rediscovered in 1992. Being still somewhat wet behind the ears, I was nervous about my findings, as it challenged the then known social organization of the genus Rhinopithecus. All existing publications until that time stated that Rhinopithecus live in multi-male, multi-female social units, whereas my observations showed that the basic social unit of the Tonkin Stubnose monkey comprises a one male unit, and that different units frequently associate with each other to form the band. Moving on, here we have some illustration of the Semnopithecus, Semias, and Trachypithecus groups. And of course, that includes the Popalanga, which was described as a new species just last month. All right. 
To all primatology students out there in the audience, here are some questions for you. One, why do we have a large diversity of monkeys belonging to the family Cercopithecidae? And two, why are macaques the most successful primate taxon next to humans? Why not apes? Don't forget to submit your responses to your respective lecturers. To date, we have 20 singing and swinging ape species, including the most threatened of all primates, the Hainan gibbon, with just 30 individuals known in the wild. Finally, the orangutans, including the recently described but critically endangered Tapanuli orangutan. Now I'd like to go back to the questions I raised earlier, that is, what led to the discoveries of the new primate species in recent years, and why the difference in numbers with the IUCN red list? Firstly, indeed there are still nooks and corners in Asia that remain inaccessible to the international scientific community, mostly due to security reasons. For example, the Annamite mountain range that straddles pretty much along the common borders of Vietnam and Laos, and of Vietnam and Cambodia. That region is simply a gold mine of biodiversity, with numerous floral and faunal taxa waiting to be discovered. Secondly, advances in genetics have led existing races and subpopulations to be elevated to the subspecies and species level. Now, the reason why there's a big difference with the IUCN red list is that the list is simply not up to date. There remain many primate species and subspecies that needs to be assessed. It should be noted that the IUCN red listing for primates is currently undergoing some rapid changes. Therefore, the threatened statuses of the primates listed may have changed in the last few weeks and months. Some of the assessments were from as early as 2008 and they definitely need updating. And as we gain better data, even those assessed in 2015 now needs a reassessment. So do take extra caution when referring to the IUCN red list. Do look closely at the year of assessment too, not just at the citation year or the date that you downloaded the assessment. So basically, some of the new species are indeed discoveries, while others are new descriptions. However, there is a downside to these exciting discoveries and new descriptions. They have resulted in a sudden reduction in the population sizes of some taxa, causing them to be more threatened than before. Nevertheless, if we go by the IUCN red list, it does give us an indication of the threatened status of the Asian primates. If you look at this pie chart, it is definitely not good news. 83% of the Asian primates are threatened with extinction. Given that we now recognize more species and subspecies than that assessed by the red list, therefore we can expect probably far more than 83% of the Asian primate taxa threatened with extinction. The major threats and stresses are habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation due to various causes, and hunting and trapping for various reasons. Recently, I employed the IUCN CMP Unified Classification of Direct Threats to assess the threats to Asian primates, and I found 67 that threatened the actual primates and 62 that threatened their habitats. Worse is that almost 80% of these direct threats can lead to other stresses such as fragmentation and edge effects. And significantly, fragmentation of the habitat can, in turn, result in more than a hundred new potential direct threats to the Asian primate populations. In essence, Asian primates are severely threatened with extinction. Over the next couple of slides, I shall quickly highlight some of the drivers causing this rapid decline. Firstly, widespread unsustainable activities, especially mega development projects. Then 
increasing demands for tropical hardwood timber and escalation of various forest crimes. The demands for wildlife or their parts and derivatives have increased multifold. Corruption among senior officials and top politicians have become the norm, allowing the big fish to remain free. Then we have the consequences of the climate crisis and escalating extreme weather events. Unsustainable development and the climate crisis have further pushed the poor and the marginalized to increase their pressure on biodiversity. Then we have unprecedented wildfires. This illustration is from 2019 alone. We also have an increase in the incidences of infectious diseases and transmissions, plus further deterioration of our behavior and attitude. And worse, there are those taking advantage of the pandemic to fill up their pockets. Now we come to the second part of my talk, Asian primatology. It wasn't until the mid-1900s did primatology in Asia take off, primarily in China, India and Japan, by both Western and Asian pioneers. In other parts of Asia, development in the field of primatology has been somewhat patchy. Indonesia has and is doing steadily well. Vietnam and the Philippines, although latecomers, are picking up the pace. Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, Bhutan are still fledglings. There are a few odd researchers in Thailand, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka keeping it alive. Malaysia saw a boom in the 70s and 80s, but it entered a cryogenic state with the last of David Chiva's students until recently. But interests are still poor. Nevertheless, the overall growth in primatology in Asia has been remarkable. We now have more field and lab studies on Asian primates, more qualified Asian graduates and researchers, more colleges and universities offering primate related courses and programs. There's even more publications, symposia and conferences on Asian primates. We have better awareness, public support and public involvement better funds for research, training, and supporting various conservation projects and activities. In fact, we have also contributed to the establishment of protected areas and improved wildlife and habitat legislation. However, primatology in Asia continues to face several gaps and challenges, some of which I mentioned earlier. Let's first look at interests. Interest in this field are still poor in many Asian countries. There are a number of reasons for this. Some have no idea that you can get a degree studying primates. Others are driven by the desire to succeed financially. Unfortunately, the more challenging ones are to those that are interested. They include family objections or obligations, or the absence of such academic programs locally, or lacking the financial capacity to study at home or abroad. Plus, there are cases of missed opportunities because some local universities have quotas based on race and religion. Another major gap in Asian primatology is access to and the quality of information. In many parts throughout the range, we are still missing good information on the statuses of many taxa or populations. And in some parts, we are still a far cry from obtaining data on the ecology and behavior, or many of us or our institutions cannot afford access to good publications. And apparently, much information exists in consulting and NGO reports. Either we are not aware of them, or they are not available for public viewing. Then we have some issues relating to the credibility of the reports, both published and unpublished, ranging from weak methodology to erroneous citations and data, to plagiarize and falsify information. And then there are also those reports that have 
conveniently left out certain crucial information because it may affect the project or the funder. Having protected areas do not mean that primates and their habitats are safe. Some protected areas are simply paper parks. Many are residual lands, isolated and heavily fragmented. Most protected areas have no monitoring data. And again, some monitoring data are subject to doubt. What about the protected area staff? Many are ill-equipped, ill-trained, ill-staffed and ill-paid. We occasionally come across other issues such as lazy or incompetent staff, or worse, those that are the offenders themselves or facilitate the offences. Sadly, in some places, posting to protected areas is seen as a punishment. Not many wants to go to remote places, so you tend to get the lazy, incompetent ones or those not in the boss's good books assigned to the protected areas. In other cases, the good stuff either gets transferred or killed if they do a good job. In some countries, personnel for protected areas is almost entirely supplied by the forestry college or university, and they are pretty territorial about it. Also note that conservation and protection is a relatively new phenomena in some Asian countries, and these forestry colleges were previously training students on how to value and extract timber. And overnight, you have the same instructors teaching them how to protect and conserve biodiversity. Many training activities and programs have been carried out for the staff. But sometimes the training is one-off and sometimes impractical. And sometimes you don't get the target group that you need to train. Some of the issues mentioned earlier also apply to the existing laws and enforcement. Sometimes we do not have the appropriate laws. Sometimes they are outdated, weak and full of loopholes. And sometimes we do not have the capacity or the will to implement them. Enforcement in some countries can be somewhat complex when the protected area staff may not have the arresting power. In addition, most often, the judiciary has a poor understanding of conservation, resulting in the crimes being treated as petty offences. Frequently, the penalties and punishments do not match the crimes committed. And of course, there are some offenders who are more equal than others. And some enforcers are themselves the offenders. We also lack concrete institutional arrangements to deal with transboundary issues. What about tertiary education? Only in a few Asian countries are there dedicated programs in primatology. Others depend on the interests of the faculty or the students. The cost of tuition is also a constraint. Then there's the shortage of competent educators. In some cases, the universities suffer from inbreeding. That is, the educators are wholly the products of their home institutions. Sometimes this can be good, at other times it does not encourage innovative learning. In some cases, it is the norm for academic advisors to take senior authorship of their graduate students' works, which is highly demotivating for the up-and-coming young primatologists. Moreover, we have an overemphasis on the need to publish in high-impact journals. Let me ask you something. From the standpoint of conservation, what's more important? An article published in a high-impact journal or an article with high impact? There will be no primates to study if we do not urgently reorient the focus of our research to include strong conservation applications. That's my personal appeal. By the way, do you know that impact factors were initially used for guiding libraries for making decisions about journal subscriptions? And now it messes up the academia. And it's also used by universities to improve their rankings. Moreover, because of the push to publish in impact factor journals, many have become victims of predatory journals and even bogus conferences. And what about the research and research outputs? 
again patchy. Several researchers, not by choice, have poor academic training and poor English proficiency, thus affecting the quality of their outputs or their advancement in this field. One common problem I find with researchers, Asians or otherwise, is that we are quite an arrogant lot. Now, we cannot expect the policy makers, decision makers and the relevant authorities to simply pick up our wondrous scientific publications and act upon our findings and implement our recommendations, especially when they are written in a manner that cannot be understood by the common person. What I'm saying here is that if we truly care about our study animals, then we cannot stop with just the publication. We need to find ways and means to get across to those that can translate our outputs into practice. Another issue not uncommon with researchers is that they have a poor understanding of the Asian culture. We approach the authorities with our best science and our best arguments, but we fail to acknowledge that in some Asian cultures, logic does not matter as much as relationships. So build up that trust first. Now, how often do you come across publications that state, this is the first study of blah, 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 and blah? Some are rightly so, but what about others? Well, I can only assume that they wish to make a mark for themselves, or they do not wish to make a comparison with earlier studies. For whatever reasons, the authors have inadvertently prevented us from seeing and understanding the changes that have occurred and why they have occurred. Additionally, I feel it is also an insult to the earlier researchers, some of whom paved the way for the rest of us, and that too, under very trying conditions. Sometimes I feel tired reading papers that give recommendations upon recommendations of the need for conservation, but without shedding any light on the how-to. Most of the implementing parties are not scientists. They need clear guidance. Lastly, here I have various issues and constraints undermining effective conservation of primates in Asia. Firstly, researchers and NGOs are frequently very territorial over species or sites, sometimes with nasty consequences. Besides the conflicts among NGOs, it is also quite common for NGOs and governmental agencies not to see eye to eye. Frequently, the difficulties lie with the governmental agencies. Corruption is rife in some countries and political conflicts commonplace. All these affect conservation, either directly or otherwise. Nevertheless, most are sensitive to criticisms. Some even go to the extent of denying research permits as a response to the criticisms. However, it is also not uncommon for the locally based international NGOs to come on as arrogant colonials without taking into consideration the socio-political and other constraints that these governmental agencies may have. This is partly due to the breach of trust by the NGOs and the various projects. And of course, both parties tend to give too much lip service thus giving rise to mutual distrust. Although almost all projects claim success, yet the success of these projects is questionable. Many projects report success in terms of the number of meetings, number of workshops, how many study tours they have carried out, and so on, but nothing much on the conservation status of the species and habitats. Then we have cases of funding agencies that are overly generous with the range of country applicants, despite their weak proposals. They are helping neither the applicants nor conservation. So where do we go from here? I shall not go into a lengthy list of recommendations. We already know what these recommendations are. We hear them time again. So what options do we have? I'm sure as I went through the gaps, the issues and the constraints, many of you have already thought up of the options, whether you realize it or not. So what about the options? Well, we would need about four to five days of intensive brainstorming sessions to formulate amicable strategies and approaches. Nevertheless, I will highlight one option already in place. Through Asian Primates Journal, we are allowing researchers and conservation practitioners, one, free access to literature related to their works, two, 
a free outlet to disseminate their findings, and three, a venue to highlight issues relating to the persistence of Asian primates and their habitats. Thus, we are partly addressing the gap relating to access to information. Now, many of the manuscripts submitted to APJ are academically weak and are written in poor English. But if they contain useful information, then our reviewers and editors guide them through a series of communications to help them improve their submissions. Even for the ones that APJ reject, we take the extra effort to point out their errors and suggest ways whereby they can improve, not just the writing, but various aspects of the research. In this manner, APJ again partly addresses some of the obstacles relating to research and research outputs. But we are not without our constraints too. Getting access to qualified and willing reviewers is a nightmare. Most competent ones are too busy. This is kind of depressing. At every conference and in many publications, we frequently hear the call for investments into capacity development of range country primatologists. But not many are willing to contribute their time and expertise to this much needed action. By the way, all our editors and reviewers are working on a voluntary basis. To them, I'm extremely grateful. To summarize my talk, I would like to emphasize that no matter how ridiculous the gaps issues and constraints may appear, we cannot run away from them. These nuances are real obstacles to effective conservation in Asia, and some likely to other regions too. And these are the challenges we must overcome if we do not wish to see the primates any more threatened than they are now. Allow me to give you an analogy. Think of the North Americans, my face my body, my freedom. Hey, they are none of the virus's concerns, but they are real issues, issues that cause deaths. And despite being among the very first nations expected to receive the vaccines, yet they will not be free from the contagion. Why? Because they face a major constraint. A recent poll showed that one third of the US populations are anti-vaxxers. And one of the gaps lies in the fact that many of them lack the privilege to basic common sense. Think of the vaccine as a solution and the vaccination as the recommended action. That's how primatology and primate conservation in Asia is. So even with the best solutions and with the best recommendations, it will still be an uphill struggle if we do not acknowledge the obstacles and make every effort to address them. So thank you and wish all a successful winter meeting. Savadee Krap.